A running around outside who's got a very similar match to me, and therefore I am not guilty. Well, let me tell you a story, and it's a true story. About 10 years ago, a very gruesome murder was com committed in, in Scotland, and the police, the Scottish police, all arrived and they found this poor old man had been uh, murdered and somebody stuck a, a pair of scissors in their throat and it was generally not the sort of thing you do to little old ladies. And so suspicion fell upon a handyman who worked in a house a month or so previously. And they alleged that a tin containing 1,800 pounds in his, office, in, his, in his home, elsewhere, had the fingerprint of the deceased on it. Now, when you do a fingerprint case, when you examine a crime scene, one of the first things you want to do is you've got to lift all the prints, everything. And then you find out who you had and business being in the house. So you've got to go to all the people who had genuine business. So you go to the maid who works there and, and uh, the handyman and the, this one and the, that one and all the cops are there. And what you do is you then lift them, you take their prints and compare them so that you can eliminate the prints that should be there from the prints that shouldn't be there. And much to the police's embarrassment, they found on the door jamb above the body a partial thumbprint which they identified as being belonging to a young police constable called Shirley McKee. And Shirley McKee was starting off her way up the police force in the same police station that her father had been commanding officer of for the last umpteen years. And so they said to me, silly bitch, what the hell are you doing with your hands out of your pocket leaving things all over the place? And she said, that's not my fingerprint. They said to her, get off it, your fingerprint. Seven of your colleagues have identified as your fingerprint. What's your problem? And that's where it would have died for the time being. Everybody was mildly irritated with her, or seriously irritated with her for leaving fingerprints around. But there it would have stayed, but for the fact that the attorney defending the accused had got wind of the argument and the dispute. And so when she got in a witness box, he put to her that it was her fingerprint, there was a dispute, and she denied in the witness box under oath that it was her fingerprint. So now mild irritation in her colleagues turned to white hot fury. So as soon as she got out of the witness box, they arrested her, put her in chains, chucked her in a cell, strip searched her, and charged her with perjury, which carries an eight-year jail term in the good old United Kingdom. And she said it wasn't my print. I said, and your colleagues have identified it. So, what then happened was that she now had to defend herself, otherwise it was that or go to jail for eight years. And she happened upon the name of a man called Pat Wertheim. Now, Pat's quite a character. I know Pat quite well. He's a Texan. And he's a, he's a character. He's been a fingerprint expert for over 35 years. And not only did they manage to get Pat, we took a look at the fingerprint and said, this is not your fingerprint. They got a guy called Ari Zielenberg, who is Mr. Fingerprint in Europe. Ari, he's a gentle Hollander. A wonderful chap. But his quiet demeanor belies the esteem in, with which he's held in Europe. He's Mr. Fingerprint in Europe. You want to know about fingerprints in Europe? Ari Zielenberg is your man. And Ari took one of those fingerprints in. I don't know what they're smoking, but this is not your fingerprint. And then they went back to the Scottish police officers and looked at the print again. They got a few more of them in. And they said, what rubbish is this? This is her fingerprint. Look, there are 27 points of identity, 21 points of identity. And then Pat looked at me and said, there are no points of identity. And the 21 points of similarity. And that's a big difference. That's a serious difference. Anyway, then what happened? The guy south of the border, Scotland Yard, the Met, got a hold of the fingerprint and they started looking at it. And this fingerprint was now all over the world. Everybody was looking at it. And everybody said, What the hell are these Scottish guys smoking in there? And, uh, what are they eating with their haggis? Because this is clearly not showing his fingerprint. 
and the Scottish guys lost that ground six lives. And eventually, the government paid out Shirley McKee three quarters of a million pounds for wrongful arrest and the whole hoo-ha that went about it. So we're starting to understand that what used to be a bedrock subject of absolute identification, which is the way it was sold to court, has got feet of clay. Now, interestingly, up until a few years ago, they could come along and they could they, they take a bullet out of the corpse, and then for whatever reason they decide to arrest you, they find that you own a 38 special or a 9 mil or whatever the case may be. And they take they take your pistol and some of the ammunition, they fire it into a water tank and they get the bullet out. And they put the two bullets together back to back on a ballistics microscope. And because the theory is that you make micro situations which are absolutely unique, they, the, the cops will tell you that these micro situations are absolutely unique to your gun because you'll never get two guns with the same. Well, I'm not so sure about that. 20 odd years ago, I was called into the defense of a bunch of guys who were shooting off AK 47s, of which I strongly disapprove in town. If you want to do it on the shooting range, that's fine. <coughs> but in town, I think this is not a new social thing to do. <laughs> and they got all before court. And what I had done a few weeks prior to that was I'd been briefed by the Jamaican Traffic Department to fire shots out of all of their sidearms and keep the bullets so that we could, if there was a shooting, we could then match the bullet to the gun. That was the theory. So I did this. And early on in the, in the series of tests that I did, I fired two shots out of a pistol. It's called a 9 mil pistol. They all use 9 mils. I fired two shots out of a 9 mil, which was manufactured by Tan Foglia, an Italian crowd, I think. And then I fired two shots a day or so later from another person, which was a Beretta 9 And lucky enough, there were a whole range of similarities between the bullets. In fact, those two bullets ended up in a dispute. And a cop came to court and said, those are fired from the same gun. You would have a lot of difficulty as a defendant to prove that they didn't come out of the same gun. Because it looks just like they came out the same gun. And then I started to do some literature research. I found out that, that I was not alone in thinking that this possibility was the case. And in fact, we now know that 21%, at least, you can get 21% of striations on bullets. They will match by chance alone. They can be fired from completely different weapons. And 21% can end up matching. Now, if you're facing a jail sentence or a rope, on that kind of evidence, that's very disturbing. It's not good to have that. And that's yet another one of these things where that was sold as 100% certainty to the court, and it's not. And we are starting to realize that a lot of forensic science which is handed out as gospel truth to the courts is anything but. And it led, the, the Mayfield case led to a, a request by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States to relook at all these things. And they did, they relooked at the whole lot. And they put a whole bunch of people onto looking at the science behind the forensics. And the result was the quote, I gave you one of the quotes out of the report, which I read to you just when I started, when I kicked off this thing. There's precious little science in all the stuff that everybody hands out. And it's, it's dangerous in the hands of people who are less honest than poor. It's, if you get a cop who wants to get a conviction, I'm going to give you an example. 